No social critic is more withering toward identity politics and cancel culture than the playwright and comedian Andrew Doyle. Whether it's creating Titania McGrath, the Twitter parody of a woke 20-something poet, or penning a best-selling defense of free speech, the Oxford-educated and openly gay Doyle never misses an opportunity to show the folly of political correctness. He sat down with Reason to talk about his forthcoming book, The New Puritans, How the Religion of Social Justice Captured the Western World. Andrew Doyle, it's good to be talking to you again. Thanks for talking to Reason. Thanks for having me. Nice to see you. Our, uh, let's, you know, we've we've talked a couple times over the past few years on on similar, although you know, disparate themes, but mm. they all revolve around kind of wokeness, political correctness, conformity as the enemy of the good society, of of critical thinking, of of anything that approaches progress. Um, the new book which is, I'll just say, editorialized at the beginning, is a phenomenal read. It's a learned read that is, um, you know, it, it makes, it's cream spinach. It tastes delicious, <laughs> while it also giving you fiber and, and much needed minerals and vitamins. So it's the New Puritans, how the religion of social justice captured the Western world. What is the uh, elevator pitch? So or you you are with one of your heroes, Roald Dahl, in the glass elevator <laughs> that shows up at, in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Well, I suppose uh, the, it, what what do you define the book quickly? Yeah, I mean, in an elevator pitch, it's effect. I mean, I suppose the pitch relates to the reasons why I wrote the book, and I think um, we are in a, at a stage now in this culture war or whatever we want to call it, where many many people are baffled. Um, they, you know, there's this movement that has sort of seized control of all of our major institutions, be they political or academic or the media, uh, over in the UK, the NHS, even the army, uh, the judiciary, absolutely everywhere, seized power and control in a way that the political correctness movement of the 80s and 90s never did. And this is the major distinction between the two. Um, and yet the movement, and we can see, most people can sort of see that this ideology has regressive elements, is taking us back, uh, taking us to some very dark places, that it is illiberal, that it is divisive, all the rest of it. And yet people are confused because it uses language that describes itself in the opposite terms. So it is a movement that is grounded in what they call social justice, and yet it, it works against true social justice. Uh, it uses phrases like anti-racist, which of course everyone wants to get on board with because we're all opposed to racism. And yet people can see that Oh, hang on a minute. Suddenly we have uh, people, schools segregating children <clears throat> by skin color in the name of this anti-racism. What's all that about? Uh, yeah. Uses words like equity and pe people think that sounds great as well because they think it's the same as equality. Uh, it, you, it calls itself progressive when it is regressive. It calls itself liberal when it is illiberal. So ultimately, the more I've read and thought about this, the more I've realized that the culture war of the present is really a battle about language and who gets to control definitions of words. And so in order to combat it, there's an extra shield, if you like. You know, you can't just challenge the ideas that are being presented in the way that in a traditional uh, method through the Socratic method or through traditional evidence led and enlightenment values, because this movement has is impervious to reason. And, and that is a deliberate aspect to it. And also its practitioners have the habit of redefining language so that you end up uh, uh, they, they, they can basically dance around the salvos of their critics because when you try and criticize them they say yeah but the words that you're using to criticize us aren't don't mean the things you think they mean um so the book has been written hopefully to make all this accessible in other words i'm using a number of analogies i call it the religion of social justice i think using the analogy of religion is very a very accessible way to make sense of this for most people i'm comparing it to uh, I call them the new Puritans because I believe it is a kind of purity culture. It's a culture that has expectations of moral purity in line with uh, what these ideologues believe to be morally pure. I have to sort of caveat that. Um, so I'm using those analogies. I'm talking through the various language, the origins of the movement, yeah. where it's come from, how it sees control. Uh, I, I give innumerable examples of where yeah. it sees control. Um, you know, when people say, there is no culture war. It's a, a right-wing myth. 
well, I've, I've layered example upon example, and if right. you read the footnotes, you'll and, see. And I should uh, have you point out, um, are you, you are not a man of the right. No, no, I'm not. Yeah. How do, how do you define your politics or your ideology or, you know, your worldview? I mean, I, I, I've i reached the conclusion that the, the this present culture war has effectively killed off right and left uh, in terms of those words are now generally not meaningfully used uh, in, in the most part. Um, so I, I find that very difficult. I think if you were to, you know, s- scholars of politics, if they were to, um, you know, think about what right and left have traditionally meant. And if you were to take my views, most of them would fit, fit into the right, sorry, the left wing category when it comes to yeah. uh, certainly economic issues and social issues. Uh, you you could make a case that I have more conservative values when it comes to education, uh, perhaps. Um, Your aesthetics are a little bit suspect, <laughs> me, uh, you know, from my point of view, but that's also partly because you're not only uh, English or, or well, I'm, you're not English, right? You're Irish. No, well, I'm English. No, right. I'm English. I'm I'm, I'm English. I, my family's from Northern okay. Ireland. Uh, yes. So I, yeah. Well, you see, this is but the I point of have... contention. My family's from Southern Ireland. <laughs> so we, but I don't know, have, na- is... I'm not a nationalist. Yeah. I don't have those impulses no. which are associated with the right. Right. I think. But, but you have, uh, I, I, I was merely getting at the point that you are, uh, and actually we'll get to this. You you talk about, um, you know, tradition in in the arts and, and aesthetics, mm. not as the enemy of innovation, but rather as the, you know, the base from which innovation changes. So you're you're not a... Uh, you're you're conservative in the sense that you value all of the great artists, certainly of the of the British tradition, but well, you're not an enemy of of experimentation and change. I suppose you would. Well, in that case, what you would say is, I suppose I'm broadly left leaning, but yeah. I am culturally conservative on a number of issues. But then, of course, the left has always traditionally had cultural conservatism really at its yep. heart. You know, if you read right. the Lion and the Unicorn by George Orwell, you will know this that that it's 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 you know, it's not. It's not something that undermines being left wing. It actually uh, right. bolsters it. So, yeah. Um, but and I'm, many I'm, of I'm the great interested. modernists, uh, I mean, the most experimental modernists were, uh, you know, oftentimes were right wingers. So, I, you know, somebody like Ezra Pound or even T.S. Eliot right. exactly. are hardly left wingers as they're smashing uh, traditional forms. Well, um, so let's talk about um you know the the book is called the new puritans mm-hmm. um and that's a, that's a controlling metaphor that you that you come through uh and it and it ties into the religious dimension that you say yeah. this is fundamentally religious um at various points you talk about wokeness or or critical social justice i guess is your preferred term as counter enlightenment um just very briefly sketch out what you mean by the enlightenment what are the what are the key virtues and values of the Enlightenment, and then how does critical social justice act as counter Enlightenment? I, I suppose the key values would be evidence led epistemology, reason, rationality. Um, you know, in other words, assessing uh, the data and drawing a conclusion from it, um, challenging oneself, uh, not assuming that one is right about absolutely everything, avoiding faith based. Uh, positions wherever possible, and then uh, arguments from authority, which uh, yeah. which faith based arguments tend to be. Yes, so the phrase counter enlightenment is borrowed from Isaiah Berlin, although he wasn't talking mm-hmm. specifically about this. But but it it seems to me um, that when ideologues dismiss the enlightenment as just the product of you know cis white males, mm-hmm. you know dead white men in periwigs is a, a phrase that is used. Um, then I suppose. Uh, we are right to call this the counter enlightenment. And of course, mm-hmm. so much of what is being propagated now is, is based on belief. I mean, we hear that phrase lived experience practically all the time. Uh, one, one individual's perception of something is suddenly taken as evidence. You'll notice that their accusations are taken as proof. Um, so uh, it, it, it is drawing us back into, uh, uh, and, and it depends, it depends upon the abandonment of critical thinking in order to to operate and all of that what is what is the role of the individual in in kind of enlightenment thinking and then in in counter enlightenment kind of pushback yeah there's a bit Um, of a there's a bit of a conflict within the critical social justice movement about this because really they are collective they they're they're they're, they're conformists uh they they believe in uh as with all ideologies there is a set of rules that one follows and uh that's why 
when you meet one of these woke activists, you can tell, you will know what their opinion is on every single subject because they're not thinking for themselves. They're following a script. Yeah. So they, they, it, it, they, and they are collective insofar as they see people predominantly through group identity, through uh, predominantly through race, gender, and sexuality. Uh, mm-hmm. And therefore they see people in terms of collectives. Um, at the same time, they make uh, grand claims to hyper individualism and expressing themselves as, as who they really are and, and all of this kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. But no, they they are collectives, and I think um, I think one has to think in terms of the individual. And I mean, that kind of thing terrifies me—the idea of sort of bundling people together in terms of some immutable characteristic uh, over which they have no control. Um, the very nature of art, and this is why I emphasize the practice of art so much in the book, is that it is, I mean, I quote uh, Emile Zola's definition of art, which is life seen through a temperament. And I think art is the ultimate expression of individuality. You know, the great artists yeah. could not be replicated by any other individual. It is solely them. Uh, they can uh, certainly influence others uh, in terms of the craft of art. But ultimately, the the creation in of itself is is very, very, is always singular in great artists. The you know the enlightenment is fascinating and uh, you know i i'm a uh follower of friedrich hayek when he talked about you know there were there was and I mean, he's not original in this thought but uh you know that there was not one single enlightenment but many enlightenments right. but most of them fixated on some empowerment of the individual that yeah. uh you know individuals finally got a, a the ability to choose among different options and how to live they were set free from collective identities forced on them from religion or um, you know, or government or whatever in, in economics they they gain yeah. more freedom and that's all great um, and, but at the same time it is true that the Enlightenment also ushered in an era some of you know in in a freer society where people did all sorts of things there was also the development of new kind of scientific based understandings of of groups mm. uh, racial science is really an outgrowth of the enlightenment like to, uh, making racism obviously always existed but it became scientific uh, yeah. when you look at people like freud marx and um and darwin the kind of three great you know thinkers of of enlightenment of the enlightenment in many ways they reduced people in various ways to urges that kind of minimize individualism yeah um so within the uh, the enlightenment there is kind of a struggle over group identity oh, sure. or you know or or motivation and individualism absolutely i mean you can't just simply say the enlightenment is this one set of values that is right. applied i mean it's like it's like anything else it's like conflicts within marxism or within, yeah. within conservatism but you know that you always have those conflicts although notably the conflicts within critical social justice are few and far between because what happens is yeah. someone steps out of line ever so slightly and they turn on them and attack them and destroy them. Right. So that, that's their sort of way to, and that's that's. Yeah. I think th- that's what makes it such a banal ideology. You know, it doesn't have space for those kind of discussions and dis- right. dis- disagreements. Oh yes, I'm, I, not trying, I, I, I'm not trying to simplify the Enlightenment. What I'm trying to do oh, is, yeah. is draw out what I consider to be its key virtues, uh, and, and virtue, virtues, by the way, which have underpinned all of our progress over the past right. 200 yeah, years. Yeah, material and moral, it, right? Exa- and Progress, artistic. Yeah. And, you know, every, yeah. and I think all of that, and, and you know, drawing on uh, John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, where, mm-hmm. uh, when he talks of this idea of the in, individuality has to be prioritized, you know, in order to mm-hmm. enable freedom. So what I'm doing there, I suppose, is just, yes, just drawing on those virtues and saying that effectively, given all that we have achieved as a civilization, thanks to those enlightenment values, yeah. wouldn't it be terrible to jettison those values now? And that is precisely what right. the critical social justice movement is is not just asking us to do, demanding that we do. Right. Uh, and that to me is why I feel, and this is another reason I wrote the book, is because I think this is r- hugely important. I think it's, it's, it is an existential threat. And I think mm-hmm. there, there are far too many people who are dismissive of it and saying, you can just ignore these people and they'll go away. It's fine. Don't worry about it. It's, it's you know, and they have completely missed the extent of the chokehold that they hold over our society. And, and you know, th- and, we, and it has to be addressed, I feel. Do you, I mean, do you feel that um, it's not a coincidence then that as enlightenment ideals are being kind of deeply challenged or shunted aside, that we also see a rise of, um, you know, a, of a kind of tribal identity not not simply in you know in universities or something like that but at the national level in the uh in the countries of old europe and whatnot yeah. um are these 
linked somehow? Well, uh, yes. I mean, I think it is all uh, wildly connected. I think the political tribalism that we are seeing is is very much intimately uh, connected to the rise of the critical social justice movement, mm. even down to the degradation of political discourse. I mean, we've recently had a new prime minister, you know, we, 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 Liz Trump. Well, I, you know, and, and by the time this comes out there in a week, it might be another five or six. Exactly. So. And, 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 and the discussion around the new prime minister, Rishi Sunak, and you know commentators calling him extreme right wing and oh, just it's the which is not it's the discourse of of twitter is now being parroted by politicians uh you know we have a, a labor politician here calling tories scum for instance that was angela rayner referred to tories as scum yeah. it's 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 the infantile binary thinking that has been encouraged by social media and particularly by the uh, the critical social justice group who believe in effectively good versus evil they believe in a kind of Disneyfied view of the world, uh, heroes and villains, and nothing in between, uh, and that has now migrated into the realm of politics as well. And and so I and that's happening not just in the UK, but uh, uh, like you said right. across Europe. So I think that tribalism is very much connected to this, and and any form of of tribalism means a sort of um, negation of the individual, doesn't right. it? So I, I do think it's it's very much connected. Yeah. Um, so the book is titled The New Puritans. Before we talk about them and kind of their theology, um, uh, sketch out who, who are the old Puritans? How are, how are you, uh, who were they and why are they important as the starting point of your controlling metaphor? Well, well I'm actually very, being very specific about the analogy I'm drawing there. And I'm not talking about Oliver Cromwell. I'm not talking about the, 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 um, the Mayflower. I'm not talking about the, I'm talking actually very specifically about and I draw an analogy very specifically with the Puritans of Salem, of New England. Mm -hmm. um, I like the word Puritans because uh, it, it has always uh, had connotations. In fact, the origins of the word are as a as a slur, meaning those who have a kind of uh, precisionist and prohibitionist mm -hmm. tendency, what we might call priggish, I suppose, as well. Mm -hmm. um, those who seek to refashion society in accordance with their values. That the, These are all Puritan ideas. Um, and this applies very much to the uh, the uh, ideologues of the critical social justice movement, but they're not the same. They're in fact hugely different. Um, the Pur the Puritans of old always had a, uh, a, a hyper awareness of their own fallibility, you know, mm. of their own unworthiness before God. Right. This is the exact opposite of the what I call the new Puritans, because they, yeah. of course, never seem to doubt themselves at all and they they they, right. they 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 know that they are right uh they just know it um so what i'm doing but i but i did want to draw very specifically a comparison with salem and the reason for that is the puritans of salem were god-fearing decent people uh you know and for a very short period they entered into this hysteria it was not typical at all of, of puritan behavior um they were not inveterate witch hunters uh, this is not something that happened. It happened a hell of a lot more in Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it it wasn't something that they generally did. It lasted a very short period of time. So uh, what was it? Uh, February 1692 to May 1693. So just a little over a year. Mm -hmm. Came and went in a flash. And in that in that in that moment, you have the girls of the village crying witch and all various people and people going along with this hysteria, getting caught up in this hysteria. And as a result. 20 people were executed, a further five died in jail. So, um, but but everyone thereafter repented their part in this and they knew that they were wrong and they, uh, you know, but what that comparison, that analogy, I think is quite revealing to what is happening today because I think so many of these activists and those who believe them are caught up in a kind of hysteria that is based on what they call today lived experience. In Salem, the prosecutions were secured on the basis of what they called spectral evidence. In other words, the girls lived experience. The girls saw these demons and devils right. and and that was their truth, their way of knowing. And that was taken as evidence. In fact, the Salem witch trials collapsed in their entirety when the deputy governor of the colony wrote to the leading clergyman in the country to ask whether spectral evidence was admissible in court and was told by no means, absolutely not. And therefore all of the cases collapsed because it was solely the lived experience of the girls that secured the prosecutions. There was no further evidence beyond that because it obviously didn't happen. So 
And what, Although, what? in some ways, the the victims kind of consented. Some of them, I mean, some of them famously were like, fuck you, you know, you're wrong. But others were like, eh, I well, guess this, I'm guilty that, of that's something. How, that, that's how cancel culture works, isn't it, as yeah. well? I mean, pe- pe- you know, this is why the comparison works, because so many people go along with this out of fear for their own necks, out right. of fear of, you know, because of self-preservation. This was the key thing that Arthur Miller talked about when he wrote The Crucible. Mm-hmm. He said the thing that really drove him was seeing during the Red Scare, during the era of McCarthyism, seeing powerful people capitulate for the sake of self-preservation. He found that terrifying. And that's why you get this clear sense in the crucible uh, that the magistrates don't really believe it. And that is very made very, very clear in the film adaptation that Miller wrote the screenplay for. There's an extra scene in that where Abigail Williams, played by Winona Ryder, goes to see uh, the judge. I think it's Danforth, yep. And says, oh, and accuses Reverend Hale's wife. And Danforth says to her, you are mistaken. Now, that actually happened. Red- Reverend Hale's wife was accused and no prosecution was forthcoming. So there were so many cases where the magistrates, where a powerful person was accused and the magistrates just gently corrected the girls and invited them to move on, which suggests very strongly that they knew it wasn't real. Uh, most notably, uh, Reverend Samuel Willard, who was the acting president of Harvard, was accused. And they simply said, no, you must mean Constable Willard, who's already in jail. You've already accused him. Of course, the devil doesn't make those kind of errors. But you see, why I think that's important is if we see the activists of today, the crazy blue haired anime avatar types you find on Twitter who are screaming that there are fascists in every corner, turfs everywhere, witches, in other words, Mm. um, those who are crying witch, in other words, it wouldn't matter if we could just ignore them. If we just said, you know, be on your way, it wouldn't matter. But all of the elites capitulate to them, truckle to their bidding. They implement policy at the highest level on the basis of what these screaming activists say. And that's the equivalent of the elites, the magistrates and the ministers in Salem. who, Rather than say to the girls, this isn't true, they said they went along with it. And that's why I think the comparison So dig into that a little bit, both in Salem, but then also more importantly in contemporary times. Why do people in the place of power who, who could say, no, you're wrong or we're not going along with this, why do they capitulate? Not just um, not grudgingly, but they seem to go in whole hog oftentimes. Well, you know, obviously, I... like oh, we're going to restructure the entire university, the entire corporation, the entire nonprofit world around these claims. I can't read minds, of course, so I can't be sure. But there yeah. are various reasons why people do, and we can talk in abstract terms here. Most, most importantly, fear and intimidation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, even someone like Rebecca Nurse in Salem, who was one of the mm-hmm. most respected women of the town of the village rather um was you know she said the girls aren't being truthful this is one of their silly seasons and she was hanged so Mm -hmm. the consequence so this is the the same reason why people don't speak out in support of jk rowling because they see the rape and death threats she gets all the time they see how people attempt to brutalize her and they don't want that people want an easy life so fear and intimidation cannot be underestimated Mm -hmm. as an impulse and if you don't think that powerful people get afraid you would be wrong if you look at so recently uh keir starmer who's leader of the opposition one of the most powerful men in the uk was asked the question do women have penises and you could see in the interview the terror (laughs) the terror behind his eyes he was absolutely frightened he he was stammering he was stuttering he couldn't answer the he couldn't tell the truth and and it's a weird question isn't it because not only do that can they not speak the it's truth? kind of like the inverse of a surrealist image uh, or something <laughs> like can a you know can a fish be soluble it's, i don't know it's, you know it's, it's bizarre like, it's like it's funny because he must know that we all know that he knows the answer to that question right. and that compounds the fear because not only is there the fear of what the activist will do to him if he gets it wrong but there's also the fact that he's clearly humiliated. He's, he's embarrassed not to be able to answer it truthfully. Yeah. So all of that's going on. And I think that's part of it. Do you I think, think um, some of it is also generational in the sense, and, and you touch on this a couple of times in the book, but, you know, we're, and I'm, I'm not sure, I mean, it's interesting in the Salem case, and I've read different kinds of analyses that are all fascinating, you know, a, a Marxist analysis of the Salem witch trials, and that it was really about dispossessing certain people of property. Um, you know, well, that was uh, there well. Are, that could have been part of it. You know, yeah, no, and there's like psychological ones, etc. But 
you know, part of that, what's interesting is that it's young girls who are mm -hmm. generally not that powerful in a, not in that society, but it was a youth movement in, in a particular way. Yeah. Um, but in contemporary times now, although, you know, clearly people like Ibram X. Kendi and Robin DiAngelo, who are kind of lead or bestseller book authors in the United States are not exactly spring chickens, but this has the feel of a youth movement. We are at a period where the baby boom generation, which has been you know, just clogging um, every every hierarchy, every every level of society. Uh, you know, for decades now, um, going back to the sixties, is getting a little bit feeble and old. Um, mm -hmm. How much of this is a generational thing? Of where um, every every maybe twenty five or thirty years, people get cleaned out, and this you use any means necessary, and this happens to be the means to kind of get rid of the old guard. Well, the reason why this isn't really a generational thing is because uh, uh, the studies into the prevalence of this mode of thought are quite clear that uh, the woke, if we want to call them that, are mm. a minority in all generations, including the young. Mm. I mean, you could say that there are more of them in the younger groups in Generation Z, but most of Generation Z are against this stuff. So, you know, w with that in mind, the idea of interpreting this as just older people failing to keep up with changing norms right. is just factually wrong. And also, you know, my experience has been that the most vociferous uh, proponents of the woke movement are basically people of my age and a bit older. You and how old are you? I'm 44. Okay. You, you mentioned Robin D'Angelo. You mentioned Ibram X. Yep. Kendi. But there's also the academics uh, who have really driven this in, in various mm -hmm. uh, humanities departments. When I, I mentioned this in the book, but when I gave a talk at uh, Aberystwyth University, the, the young people were great and they didn't necessarily agree with me on everything, but they wanted the conversation and wanted to be challenged. And, and it was yeah. the department. It was people older than me who said right. this talk is against our... And certainly policy. all of the theoretical kind of apparatus that's being used here and yeah. you go into this, this has been kicking around the university. When I, I'm 59, I was in grad school in the late 80s and the mid 90s in literary and cultural studies. Yeah. And... All of the theories that were being taught then are the ones that are being applied. Exactly. Now. So I don't yeah. think we can put this down to generational differences at all. I just right. think that doesn't work. But it is, I guess, one uh, thing that is fascinating is that, you know, and particularly universities, right? Because universities are hundreds, if not thousands of years old, and yeah. they are slow moving, conservative, traditional institutions. It's kind of amazing how they are revealed to be paper mache and, you know, they just get pushed yeah. over. They, they go down, you know, I mean, you know, they, they go down without a fight, it yeah. seems. It's frightening, isn't it? I mean, that's, and that has been the problem, as I, I continually try to emphasize in the book, is yeah. that it, it, it's not the people making the demands, it's the people capitulating to the demands, it's the people in power. That, that has been the problem from the start. And it's, it's horrifying, isn't it, that academia in particular is susceptible to, to this stuff. I mean, we all thought this could sort of be contained within the humanities, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because people in the humanities have the luxury of saying that there's no such thing as objective truth, you know, and, you know, they're dealing with poetry and, <laughs> and things mm -hmm. like that, metaphysics. Yeah. Uh, but when you get into the role of science, you know, when you have, I mean, I mentioned in the book that example in New Zealand where the New Zealand government wants to introduce um, multiple ways of knowing into, uh, <clears throat> into the classroom alongside the theory of evolution. So you're teaching evolution, but you also have to teach the kids that maybe raindrops are tears of a goddess, a forest goddess. Mm. Um, now, and when one academic, in fact, a number of academics signed a letter sort of saying, look, we respect indigenous people's rights to believe whatever they want and that there's value in tradition and culture, but this has no place in a science classroom. They were hounded right. and destroyed for it. So, And if you go with that, then it's not uh, far that you're going to be teaching that tears are rain are really tears from Eric Clapton. Right. Well, it, maybe yeah. you might even go down that road. Absolutely. Yeah. And he who is like it, who was likened to God for much. You could of his go career. anywhere so with this. Like, stuff. Yeah. That, that's the that's the that's the problem. And the fact that now the sciences appear to be captured. Mm -hmm. Now, now that major medical journals are publishing scientifically illiterate nonsense. That's a problem because then there's a legitimation crisis. Then we don't know. You know, it, when a leading medical journal says that sex is a spectrum and mm -hmm. anyone and even a child can tell you that's not true. Yeah. What, where the hell do you go from there? It's a, it's a so terrifying. What, explain that when you say sex is not a spectrum because uh, uh, people are either they either have male or female sexual reproductive organs, um, 
or no. well, that's not necessarily uh, but, that's not necessarily yeah. the, the case because there's all sorts of okay. a, a, ambiguities when it comes to right. secondary sex characteristics. We're talking about the yeah. production of gametes. Every yeah. human being is a uh, Produces one or produces the other. Produces one or the other. Large gametes right. or small gametes. Yeah. There is no intermediate sex. People who mention um, intersex people, intersex people are either male or female, right? right. So, and, and and by the way, intersex people are, are, are getting pretty sick of being used uh, as a pawn uh, to make this false point about yeah. science, you know. So. And, so, and, and the, so there's a confusion between sex, which is a biological reality, and gender or sexual orientation or yes. other things that... that do exist either, uh, you know, at least partly as performance well, or um, or on a spectrum. Well, no one ever had a problem with the idea of gender uh, being uh, mm. uh, largely socially constructive, right. constructive and performative, as Judith Butler argued um, mm-hmm. back in the day. Although she seems to have gone full one eighty on that, um, mm-hmm. you know, ver- you know, no one ever had a problem with this idea because we all know we all have combinations of traditionally masculine and feminine traits. Right. There is no one who is solely masculine and solely right. feminine that's not but the but the problem with this is not a, a, an awareness or acknowledgement that uh, that gender is something that is not fixed that is fluid mm-hmm. that doesn't mean that what what activists are saying is that they want gender to replace sex in terms of the formation of public policy yeah. and that's where it gets that's where it's a problem and it gets into you i think you mentioned in the book i mean into kind of cloud cuckoo land of uh, somewhere in like the national health uh, system or something in England, but people were talking about, uh, uh, what was it, people who menstruate rather than women. Um, But you get into a, you know, a situation where the, everybody is being treated as if, um, you know, like, I mean, just basic medical information oftentimes doesn't get communicated oh, it's, because it's, we are trying to make sure that we don't offend anybody who identifies exactly. as a particular well, well, sex. You you will know from, you know, back in the day, there were all sorts of, I mean, a lot of feminists said that uh, gender was fully socially constructed. And of course it's right. not, it's a combination of biological factors and social factors. Yeah. But they also used to, uh, some of the more radical feminists said that uh, biological sex was a social construct as well. Right. Uh, and now that has become a fairly commonplace view as well. I mean, I remember reading that when I was an undergraduate and thinking and knowing how absurd it was then. But now that has been, and I, I never thought it would catch on as being a, a sort of legitimate right. thing. But when you start advancing, and it's an ideological thing, when you start advancing the notion that sex is a biological construct, which it isn't, but when you start lying and saying that, it has actual I'm sorry, that sex is a, a social construct. Yeah, sex being a social yeah. construct, right? Yeah. So there are, when it comes to, let's give the example of the NHS, the National Health Service, you know, we all have our biological sex encoded into what our NHS number. We all have an NHS number. And now, because of this uh, this prioritization of gender, you can actually contact the NHS and get your number changed so that it codes you as being the opposite sex. Mm. Now, that means you don't get then invited for smear tests if you might need them or things like this. Mm-hmm. It means there are actual ramifications. To give a very specific example, when uh, recently there was a case in London, there was a hospital, a woman was sexually assaulted on the ward. In the UK, um, people are accommodated according to their sex. There are single sex wards uh, in the NHS. Um, but they also have a policy called Annex B, where if someone says they're non-binary or identifies as the other sex, even though they are fully intact male, they, can be, they will be put on a female ward straight away, no questions asked. So people are actually accommodated according to gender identity. Now, recently, this woman was sexually assaulted on the ward. The police were called. The police went to the members of staff at the hospital and said, there's been a sexual assault on this ward. We need to investigate. And they said, that is not possible because there was no man on that ward. Now, that is actual NHS policy. The the staff had to say that. They had to lie uh, because the the man in question identified as female. So that means a rape investigation was stymied. Well, not only do, do we have the rape happen in the first place, which it, it shouldn't have happened, right. but then the, the investigation is stymied, and that's the NHS. So and that, are, that guy was the, or that you know, that patient was the rapist. Yeah, yeah. it was a man who identified as a woman. Yeah. So you know, th- there is, you know, we have a situation where where all, all of the um, where men, ide- male rapists will identify as female and be transferred to female prisons. That's actually happened. Mm-hmm. In some cases, they've gone on to commit further sexual assaults, right? So that it's not just theoretical. 
yeah. the, people's lives are being ruined because of this stuff. So it does need to be addressed. Right. So let's talk a little bit about where it comes from. Where does critical social justice, mm. um, you know, what are the roots of it? And um... well, the way I, I I talk about it in the book is that I I consider it to be a misappropriation of Foucauldian principles. Mm-hmm. Uh, that it is, um, you know, I've always said that the, that let's take. Let's take uh, the issue of sexuality, for instance. So, so Foucault, in the first volume of the History of Sexuality, talks about how the notion. And we're of that... talking about uh, Michel Foucault, the uh, French social theorist, yes, uh, historian, philosopher, polymath, who um, emerged by the end of the 20th century, and it's kind of fascinating as basically the most quoted scholar, at least right. in the social sciences and the humanities. Right, so, exactly. Now, uh, Probably best known in the United States, and it may be different in England, for discipline and punish. Yes, uh, for discipline and punish, the notion of the yeah. panopticon. Right. Uh, f- f- so he, and the idea of, I mean, his treatise on mental illness, for instance, which mm-hmm. he sees as just another, yeah. uh, you know, uh, there has been an overdiagnostic element to society of sort of demonized people right. who think or that uh he uh, in books like madness and civilization and uh, the birth of the clinic argued that a lot of medical discourse is actually a means of social control and, and you can taking... see you can see how yeah. you can get from that to the idea that yeah. biological sex as a category is something right. that has been created by a patriarchal system of power okay so yeah or a system of power right which could be patriarchal it could be many other things exactly but, well yeah. he sees power very yeah. much as not a top-down phenomenon but there's a grid running throughout society in all forms of strata and i would say i was going to give this specific example of the history of sexuality because it Mm -hmm. pertains to what i studied at university for my doctorate he he made this claim that the homosexual did not exist before the word existed in other words right uh, or or at least as a kind of coherent identity uh and which and and yeah that homosexual which is a a, um portmanteau term right that it uh, comes from uh greek and latin shows up in the late 19th century exactly right and and it defines yeah yeah, and it and it it's not that people didn't know that there were same sex, uh, you know, sex acts before that, but the idea of the homosexual as this type of person who, by definition, exactly. is uh, ill or perverse or somehow wrong. Exactly, but it, but that's not correct. Um, yeah. And there are all sorts of there's all sorts of and, ways yeah. in which uh, there have always been people who are exclusively attracted to their own sex, and right. there have always been ways in which they have expressed that. Um, and it, it pertained to my work for my doctoral thesis because I was one of my subjects was a poet called Richard Barnfield. And if you read Richard Barnfield's poetry, it is about the expression of a gay identity. He just didn't use right. the word. Right. So um, yeah. there were phrases, there were equivalent phrases. They used right. to use phrases like Ganymede or masculine mm-hmm. love was a common one. Um, right. Joseph Cady's written about that. But but anyway, my point being uh, that you can see how if you start to that premise can be misappropriated hugely into this idea of, of the the new construction of homosexuality right. the idea that in other words language brings things into being and th- this is a, a a sort of fundamental precept that which which comes again and again through the the various postmodernists uh the mm-hmm. idea that our understanding of reality is wholly constructed through language right. and that, yeah, that there is only language and that yes. language does not really refer to the outside world it refers to other words and concepts and um i've always uh, if i may uh you know the, the first academic paper i uh, wrote was about how a kind of uh uh vulgar version of postmodernism essentially replicates the sapir worth hypothesis in linguistics that we only know things that we have words for we can't even see things you know the most extreme version and again, I don't um, think it's true. I don't. I, no, no, it's plainly not true. I mean, this has been disproven by uh, you know. Just in that particular instance, there are languages that don't have a full spectrum of color terms. Right. But it's very easy to show that people who do not know the word red can reliably pick red out from other colors. Right. Uh, you know, et cetera, and things like that. Yeah. But that extreme version that reality is simply a function of language. Well, this um, is why um, under undergirds a lot of. I like the fact that you call it a misappropriation. I think of Foucault and of other postmodernists, but that's that's where you're saying the critical social justice comes out. Of. You can see it lingering, and you know they have phrases like, you know, this language normalizes hate, legitimizes yeah. hate. They have this belief that language is like a toxin, 
And what, right. it's, it's, it's why the, the critical social justice ideologues support hate speech laws and support censorship. Mm -hmm. It's integral to the woke movement is, is this authoritarian belief that language needs to be controlled. And you see that, of right. course, played out in Orwell's 1984. The party knows yeah. that in order to control thought, they control language and in Orwell's essays, of course. So right. this is really at the heart of this movement. And all of that can be traced from Foucault, from the French postmodernists. You can mm -hmm. see it's got the same DNA can't you you know and and, yeah. and, and, and uh, you know most of most of the ideologues i'm talking about won't have read foucault but but you can yeah. see how these ideas linger but but is it any wonder because foucault rather like marx became an almost religious figure right. you know um by the time you get to the era you were talking about the late 1990s and the early 2000s you have people i mean people in in academia in the humanities weren't even questioning foucault because he right. was, there was a book called Saint Foucault towards yeah. a gay hagiography that was written by David M. Halperin, um, and it's it's also just as a side, I'm sure you know this, but the, you know as people are rediscovering the historical Foucault, like the actual person, there's uh, been yeah. a series of books about his, uh, among other things, his dalliance with the uh, center right in France in France during the 1970s, uh, and where he consistent with his idea that a lot of medical discourse or helper discourse is a means of social control. He yeah. questioned social security payments, not as a way of helping people, old people not to starve, but rather to control populations that were getting antsy and things like that. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, and inevitably, when someone is deified or sanctified in this way, yeah. it draws them further and further away from who they actually were. Um, mm -hmm. So, and that's really, I think, what, that's why I don't see this as a straightforward succession of ideas. I don't see, right. you know, I mean, I talk in the book a bit about the Frankfurt School as well, because yeah, I can we? I, I would like to talk about that because in in many ways, I mean, well, let's let's talk a little bit more about postmodernism. Uh, and I, uh, you know, and I, I sound like a social justice warrior now. I identify as a postmodern libertarian because I take seriously uh, both the way that power kind of. Um, power masks itself and kind of suffuses throughout a system in ways that are it often hides its power right uh, particularly governmental powers but jean-francois leotard the french uh, uh philosopher in the in a book called the postmodern condition I, I know you know all this but he uh defined postmodernism as incredulity toward meta-narrative uh, you know basically not necessarily cynicism, but skepticism towards large explanatory systems that become naturalized or normalized to a point where they are glasses we're wearing without realizing that we're wearing glasses. And, you know, I, I think a positive vision of postmodernism is that it asks us to account for how does knowledge get produced as well as does it function in, you know, to help us become richer, smarter, freer, whatever. Um, and there's an interesting, you know, there are interesting intersections, certainly between somebody like Friedrich Hayek, um, who at various points uh, is in books like The Counter-Revolution of Science, is always emphasizing, it's a critique of the what he calls the French Enlightenment or the Continental Enlightenment. And he says that, you know, what they do is they emphasize the extent of knowledge and they have, they jump from the physical sciences to human society and say, just as we know how you know how things work because of physics, we can adapt all of that to human society and speed up or slow down or redirect progress. Right. And he thinks that's okay. a that's you know that's a uh, you know that way leads to the concentration camps essentially. But, um, well, I you know I share the idea that we should ought to have skepticism about meta narratives, right. simple explanations. Um, you know, I don't. I think the, the, there is value in in the post in the postmodern idea, and I do believe the postmodernists and Foucault included would have taken this critical social justice movement to task. It is a it is an elaborate power yeah. grab. It is a new meta narrative. Yeah. It's them. It's it's absolutely. It's people who think they're on the right side of history. You know, they, they are. Yeah. They would just they would just as much come under scrutiny. Uh, so I think that's so I think that's important to acknowledge that it is a kind right. of that it is a misappropriation or uh, well and and I don't want to I don't want to you know put you on the spot because of my petty obsessions but it seems to me that vision a kind of hayekian postmodernism i think a particular type of foucauldian postmodernism is actually part of the enlightenment because 
what is important about enlightenment is that it actually builds in a critique of itself, right. which is missing from what you're talking about. There is no auto critique of no, exactly. social justice. It it can't it cannot critique itself. Exactly, and and the problem is, the, I think when it becomes cynicism about meta narratives, you know, when it's mm-hmm. when is when you start saying there is nothing of value within that meta narrative, you know, right? The church right. or or medicine or you know, right. and, yeah, and, there is only power, right? Exactly, um, and 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 who is operating it? And yeah. power is is you know, power is important, but it's not everything, and right. and, and 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 that's the problem with these post Foucauldians is that they re- mm-hmm. reduce everything to power games and to zero yeah. sum power games. And it's not accurate. And this is also why they can say things like social liberalism is a failed project because racism still exists in society. Right. Or is as bad or is worse than it used to be because now it's invisible. That sounds like a joke, but they say that. They say that. Yeah, no, I'm I'm thinking of passages in your book. The the failure of today's kind of uh, social justice movement to acknowledge, you know, massive gains Mm. Accord, you know, if for all of the populations that they claim need to be liberated, it's yeah. um, I'm always amazed inevitably when you hear people like ta Coates in the United States talk about race relations in, you know, 2020, he cites James Baldwin in 1955 yeah. as if nothing has transpired of meaning in that. Or that it's, it's got worse, you know, I mean, yeah, Robin yeah, again, because, quickly. because at least back in James Baldwin days, you know, they called black people the N word to their face. And now it's, you know, you can, you can graduate from Harvard, you can become president of the United States, but they're still just as racist, but they're hiding it from. Well, that's, the, that's it, it, also it, yeah. the problem when you take postmodernism to the extent that, and you, you see power structures running through everything and you start to believe you're the only one who can detect them. You start right. seeing things that aren't there. You start seeing ghosts, you know, and yeah. that, that that's what I think, you know, when, when Robin D'Angelo says that Jim Crow was not as bad as the structural racism of today, which sounds like an absurd <laughs> thing to say, but she says it and she's saying it because yeah. it's harder to detect. But thankfully we have, uh, you know, Robin D'Angelo coming down from on high in her right. deus ex machina to explain everything yeah. for us. Thank God for her, right? She and it gets it. even she more it. complicated because she knows as a white woman, she is doesn't really fully appreciate it, but somehow she has managed to find the skeleton key that unlocks all these doors. It's so messed up, isn't it? it the, way, the way in which that she's constantly self-flagellating and at the same time pontificating about race is amazing. Yeah. So let's talk about the Frankfurt School a little bit, because and you and you talk about this in the book. Uh, I I don't know how it plays in uh, in the UK, but in the United States, there was a term which still gets used a bit uh, called cultural Marxism, um, and this is a term that is you know the right wing uses it to attack anything that they disagree with. But you talk a little bit in the book about that and about the Frankfurt School. Um, And the Frankfurt School, uh, explain who they are and how they fit into this, because in profound ways, the the leaders of the Frankfurt School, people like Theodore Adorno and, uh, uh, um, sorry, uh, Adorno and Horkheimer and uh, Herbert Marcuse were not postmodernists. They were right. they were kind of like the last gasp of a certain type of European modernist. Right, thing. exactly. And 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 the phrase cultural Marxism is often used by far right groups uh, yeah. as a kind of uh shibboleth anti anti Semitic yeah. uh trope. Yes. Because of yeah. you know because the Frankfurt School obviously is, uh, Jewish emigres to the to the US and right. and and it's always I mean I I you got to give the right they don't have a lot going on but like the way they're able to insinuate that a bunch of people who fled Nazi Germany are yeah. somehow really Nazis like that's always lurking it's so there's that and that's why yeah. I advise against using the phrase cultural Marxism simply because but I also say that a lot of the people who use the term do not mean it in any kind of anti-Semitic way, but, right. it, but it has become loaded with that baggage. So, but we also should be generous in our interpretations. And I think if someone uses them, yeah. let's not assume they're, 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 they're being anti-Semitic. However, um, what I, and again, it's, it's not a direct uh, line. Um, yeah. I just see, as with postmodernists, I see uh, elements of the, the, the thought within the Frankfurt School being preserved mm-hmm. within the critical social justice movement. Uh, for instance, I would say most notably, actually, the mistrust of popular culture. You know, I mean, the, the thinkers of the Frankfurt School did believe 
uh, that the failure of of a, a left wing revolution, the fa- the failure to bring that about, was largely because of the 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 masses were kind of uh, lotus eaters, you know, no no right. one popular culture. I mean, yeah, this is straight out of uh, um, Brave New World, right? Right. That uh, you know that what somehow that a brutal capitalist society that lives on the bodies of the working man, but would then send them to a movie and in a passage which i'm sure was funny when it was first re- unintentionally funny when it was first written but it gets better every year uh in dialectic of enlightenment when adorno and horkheimer talk about how the working man or donald duck gets his punishment in the movies so that the working man understands how to stay right. in line you know at, at work right exactly and i but think that that, yeah. that is that that is most definitely preserved insofar as that a lot of the attacks from the critical social justice movement are on popular culture and the effects that pop the corrupting influence that popular culture mm-hmm. has on the masses. So there's that. Um, but, but also I think when it comes to the Frankfurt school, I think the most revealing essay is Herbert Marcuse's essay on repressive mm-hmm. tolerance, um, yeah. because it feels like a blueprint for woke activists, even though they never cite it. Right. Um, but I would say this idea of, a complete intolerance of, and he specifically talks about the right, um, and you know, uh, forcibly containing those ideas by denying rights to those groups. I mean, this is something very much that the the authoritarian critical social justice movement believes. And, and Marcuse is a fascinating figure because he did come from Europe, ended up in California in the sixties, where he became a influential thinker among a lot of people on the new left the yeah. concept of repressive tolerance yes where if tolerance allows all kinds of thoughts to happen um it, it provides a safety valve where real revolution is never going to take exactly. place so you have to you have to shut down the thought and the behavior of he was talking about what he considered right-wing uh, yes. fascists and things like that which is I'm, you know i'm almost wary to to quote him because I don't want to draw attention to his essay because yeah. I think the woke would <laughs> love love that yeah. idea and would run with it. Well, they already are, I suppose. And, um, and he, but, I mean, it's fast. I know um, uh, in the Shadow University, Alan Kors and his co-author, um, um, and this was from the late 90s, talked about Marcuse as the, he's kind of the ghost at this banquet that nobody is quite acknowledging, right. that he he kind of created in a way a blueprint for getting past liberalism or the idea that there should be a marketplace of ideas or a free yeah, exchange yeah. of ideas because then nothing, no revolution will happen if yeah. everybody gets to say, say their piece. Yeah. But as I say, with all of these thinkers and these ideas, they aren't really uh, creating uh, uh, the conditions within which this ideology flourishes. It's, it's mm-hmm. almost as though certain ideas take hold within academia. Fashion explains a lot. I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't believe in this sort of concerted march, long march through the institutions. Uh, I think it's just that certain ideas stuck and other ideas died. And, and in the end, you end up with this kind of concatenation of various thought processes and the, 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 the ideas that remain fashionable. Uh, and then they spill out into society. And that's why I think it's all, mm-hmm. I'm, I, you know, I talk about the Frankfurt School and the postmodernists and the new left just to show where these ideas germinated, yeah. but I'm certainly not suggesting a direct line. I'm really not doing that because I think that- Oh, no, no, the, that comes through very clearly. I think the critical social justice movement is, is, a, is a new beast, yeah. which, which just has, which is just elements of these ideas, but they don't even necessarily know where those ideas have come from. Or why no, and I way. mean, you, you cite a couple of times in the book, uh, Frederick Jameson, who is a Marxist uh, literary and cultural mm-hmm. critic, who hated postmodernism, or he, or he believes that postmodernist thinking, uh, literally in the subtitle of one of his books, is the cultural logic of late capitalism. Yeah. Um, but you would find again and again people who are kind of taking this part of Marx and this part of you know Foucault or whoever, yeah. and putting it together into something new, which is you know that's the way ideas work and things like that. But you're right that this. It's, you know, people have rummaged around or been affected by ideas that in the past, these people might have been, you know, spewing fire at each other. But right now it's built this new kind of critical social justice. Exactly. You can't say the critical social justice is an extension of the French postmodernism. I mean, look at the way that Derrida and Foucault used to fight over ideas, you know, so it it just doesn't work that way. That that was a, there were so many different ideas going on within that discourse. Uh, it, It wasn't a blueprint. 
And more than that, the French postmodernists weren't, uh, were, they were theorizing. They weren't pushing mm-hmm. for social change in the way that the activists of today are pushing for social change. Actually, there's an interesting, um, Helen Pluckrose and mm-hmm. James Lindsay in their book talk about this moment, what they call applied postmodernism. Right. They call it the, the, the applied turn in postmodernism. And I think they date it to 1989. Because all of a sudden in 1989, you have all of these postmodernist theorists now saying, not just theorizing about the way culture and society and power work, but now we should implement this in educational terms, in right. public policy. And that's the difference. It's it's why critical race theory, as part of critical race theory, it demands praxis. It demands right. practical application in the classroom. It isn't just teaching kids about these invisible power structures that that professors of whiteness studies are are singularly well placed to detect it's about applying in the classroom and when you do that you end up with uh you know racial segregation in schools as you did in brentwood at the the brentwood school in california as you did in the american school in london that was the most expensive day school in the uk where they were dividing kids up by skin color for after school activities that's the that's praxis and and critical race theory demands it it isn't just what do you what what explains that turn to praxis and and uh, you know and there are issues i mean james lindsay in particular is a kind of difficult character to cite on a regular basis if you watch his videos where he's practicing his samurai sword things and all of that kind of stuff i think and he's, he's very good falling. at the samurai sword I, I, <laughs> I think he's very skillful well he he also uh you know i, I guess as a true academic he has a a really bad habit of alienating his co-authors kind of on a on a sequential basis but yeah. i think in that book um you know the idea of applied postmodernism and that turn to praxis is real it certainly accords with my experience in in grad school uh, in you know something was different. The '60s generation who might have actually gone to you know taking courses with Herbert Marcuse yeah. at UC Irvine or whatever, they were talking about something different than the people who were 10 or 15 years younger than them who were like, we're not we're not creating critical thinkers here. We are creating missionaries who know the truth right. and are going to go out and enforce it. Um, what explains that turn to praxis? Like uh, why you know. Uh, that's a very good question. I'm not best placed to answer that question. I think okay. I think James and Helen's book on this cynical theories does a very good job of yeah. explaining the conditions within which that originated. Um, I, I think, um, yeah, but it's a very good question. And it did happen all of a sudden, but I come back to this idea of fashion. I think so many yeah. things in, in academic theory, but also in literary, in literature, yeah. in the arts, they just all sort of... Cu- you know coalesce at the same time and right and and this is what happened at this period in the late 80s and all of a yeah. sudden they were people's academics theorists start to see themselves as evangelists they started you know yeah as moral guardians i, I mean really, i wonder if it had something to do maybe with the collapse of the soviet union and whatnot I, mean, I i had i had the experience of being in grad school, both when the Berlin, well, you know, when Tiananmen Square started, the Berlin Wall fell, and then the Soviet Union absolutely collapsed in, in Eastern Europe. And what was amazing to me is all of my, fr- you know, all of my colleagues uh, were like, I am a committed socialist, blah, blah, blah. And like when the Berlin Wall fell, I was like, yeah. did you see what happened? Like, isn't this amazing? And they're like, I, I'm not interested in that. And when the Soviet Union collapsed, they were like, you know, politics is, you know, is not an, a, a, not an interesting you know, kind of realm of ability. But then the next thing you know, they're teaching, I don't know, you know, the most insane kind of theory uh, or or they're becoming political organizers. Um, I I mean, I wish I could tell you the reason why I don't know. And also, but for whatever reason, all of a sudden, all of these academics lost their humility. I mean, I I think humility is a big part of this. You know, if you want to talk about the Puritans who are very good on humility, you know, these people don't have it at all. They don't even have a grain of it. You know, so yeah. they, they, they believe that they not only has all of human history got it wrong and they are the first generation to come along and know everything and get it absolutely right. And they, they will never be judged by future generations because they mm-hmm. found the eternal truths. I mean, it, it's it's kind of hilarious because you have to be historically illiterate to believe that that can be possible. Right. Um, it may explain. I don't again, I don't know if this trend is the same in the UK, but in the United States, uh, college is becoming less of a destination, relatively speaking. I mean, it's still, yeah. you know, popular, it's important, et cetera. But people are kind of looking for alternatives because it's become 
you know, I mean, we, we are not religious anymore in the United States. Why would we go to church for four years and, and spend a right. hundred grand paying? Exactly. For it? And I think that, that that's why the universities are collapsing and particularly the Ivy League ones, particularly Oxford and Cambridge here. I mean, they are the most woke of all the universities. Uh, yeah. We recently had last week, I think, Cambridge University German department with, were basically teaching their German, uh, as in the students who are specializing in German, not right. to use gendered pronouns in German um, and and you know the the head of the German language association said these students are going to go to Germany and people are going to laugh at them they're going to look like idiots you know yeah. this is it, it, it's it's there's something very odd about how the most privileged I mean I, I talk in the book about how closely connected this movement is to yeah. the upper middle classes it is a bourgeois movement yeah, yeah. and you know explain that Ex- well, it's, where why is that well there's all sorts of potential reasons for it but I mean firstly I'm just observing that it is the case that the majority of cheerleaders for this movement tend to be double barreled names, po- pri- mm-hmm. privately educated, very privileged. And of course, they're constantly hectoring everyone else about their privilege. And you do wonder yeah. whether there is a lo- an awful lot of projection going on here. Yeah. Uh, but also this, the movement is so obsessed with group identity along the lines of race, gender and sexuality. It doesn't care about class. And this is why I don't no. think it is a left wing movement in any way. And, and for woke activists to call themselves left wing is is incoherent. Because they, they yeah. have absolutely no interest in redressing economic inequality. It's, it's their least. Why do you it. think is is that? I mean, if we apply a kind of Foucauldian analysis, is it because that is the one thing they don't want to disrupt? That what, you know, in fact, the they money. are they're the winners of the class yeah. system. So they're going to kind of confound everybody by saying, "Oh, the real issues are gender and sexuality and racial or ethnic identity." Right. Yeah. I mean, you, again, that's intuiting motive, isn't it? Which I don't like to do, but it, you know, certainly. If I was a uh, now that victimhood has become a means to acquire power, you know, if I'm a millionaire, I haven't got much victimhood, have I? But unless I start saying it's not really about the money, it's about my skin color, or my sexuality, or, right. or some or my gender identity, you know, then then all of a sudden you can be a millionaire victim, and doesn't that feel great? So I guess I guess if you want to start going down the road of why do people think the way they do, you I think. All we can do is speculate. That's one thing I should right. say. I don't know why people do this, but I, I would imagine, you know, whereas when I was young, the idea of being a victim was something you would never want to be seen right. as and, and you'd find it a source of humiliation. Now it's a source of how you wield power over others. And so therefore, yes, I suppose uh, those who are, the, who are the most privileged in society uh, at a time when victimhood is currency, Yes, I suppose the emphasis should yeah. become on group identity. Well, they get everything else, right? Not, Why shouldn't they get victimhood? Well, not just not just about your existing demographic, but actually identifying yourself into an oppressed class. I mean, there was a recent um, survey in America of something, I think up to 40% of, of a younger group identified as LGBTQ, which means that most of those people will be heterosexuals. Uh, but queer has now become a word for heterosexuals with a kink, right? Right. So, yeah. so now you have heterosexuals who historically have been uh, the predominant right. uh, category claiming victimhood by saying, I'm now queer uh, because I don't identify in the way other heterosexuals do. Right. Or, or, like or that my kink like, is like missionary position, or I, I, I assume the missionary oh, it's, position it's is it's verboten more, among certain groups. It's even more now, boring but, than that. I mean, yeah. you had someone recently, who was it? It was a very famous politician's daughter came out as demisexual. Uh, which means that she only she only uh, can form a, a sexual bond with so- someone if there's a romantic element to it, right? My but what God. demisexual means is old-fashioned <laughs> straight person. Like it's it's it, they're basically taking yeah. this really boring, the most vanilla sexuality <laughs> and, and claiming that it's queer. Uh, it's, it's not it's even really French vanilla, for God's sake. No. So what are what are ways out of this? I, and, you, and you suggest a couple. Uh, one one revolves around uh, art, kind of like looking at art or the experience yeah. of art. Talk a little bit about that, because I, I think we share a concern. You know, you mentioned that, you know, when this stuff was just contained to the humanities, nobody gave a shit because the humanities, who cares? But that's terrifying, right? Like, you know, as, as people who spend a lot of time getting, you know, learning a lot about the humanities, it's like horrible to see that totally devalued. But, you know, the humanities, art, music, literature, fields of creative expression, history, I mean, these are, 
you know, how these are these are major things that are, you know, that help define us as human beings. Um, how can art help us get out of this critical social well, justice cul-de-sac? Yeah, well, I mean, it's no accident, is it, that a lot of the environmental activists of today who are protesting are attacking the great masterpieces of history. It happened the other day with the girl with a pearl ear- earring. It happened with the Mona mm-hmm. Lisa. Uh, it happened yeah. with Vincent van Gogh's sunflowers in the National Gallery. Um, right. You know, attacking art, and and they say they're doing it to draw attention because obviously it makes yeah. the state. You know, everyone's talking about them all of a sudden, and that might right. be true. But I think it's also quite revealing because uh, so many of the environmental activists consider themselves to be intersectional activists. In fact, the founders right. of Extinction Rebellion talk about how it's not really about climate change at all. It's about white supremacy and uh, mm-hmm. you know heteronormative values, etc. So when you have an identitarian intersectional movement. Uh, you will find that there's a correlation between that and a disregard for the great artistic achievements of humanity, mm-hmm. because they they see the Mona Lisa as as just a paint on wood, which has been daubed by a powerful white right. man in the interest of other powerful white men. They can't right. they can see they can't see the numinous within that imagery. They can't mm-hmm. see they can't see art, and they they can't judge art. They don't understand it, and there's something quite fundamental about that. And about the way in which it, it it negates, it's a repudiation of everything our civilization has achieved, really. Mm. And and so I think a, I mean, I used to do this thing, I mentioned it in the book, because I used to, when I was a teacher, and I taught the very younger kids, the 11 year old kids, I used to have this exercise where I would print out on sort of glossy, big um, paper, a, a, a great masterpiece from history, one for each of the kids, and I would I would ask them to sit and just consider it for five, five, 10 minutes just in silence, just to look at it and consider it and then talk about it. And by doing so, I feel that I helped to cultivate this appreciation for art, um, which is really lacking within our educational system. I think art history should be embedded at the primary school level, right? Mm -hmm. I I think think unless you have the capacity to appreciate art, firstly, it's kind of a life half lived, isn't it? It's it's the, 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 so much about, about the joy of being a human being is is that capacity to 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 move towards the trans transcendental which is what art is i think great art i mean um and i think it it also encourages humility doesn't it when we see these great masterpieces and 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 if if when we look at art or read a novel or, or watch a play by shakespeare if all we can see is the power structures that we are now being trained to identify which may or may not be there and of course shakespeare is all about power power conflict but 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 that's not all it is it's far from it right and if 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 all you're seeing and also if you're only interpreting power through the lens of group identity then you're also you haven't even got a great a grip on power and power structures and how power works so you know it's it's such a reductive lens through which to view art but more than that it it's I do not believe that art can thrive in this current climate. I don't think we can produce great artists in a world in which everything is reduced to power structures on the basis of group identity. Uh, I don't think we can produce great artists who are afraid to take risks. Uh, I mean, the very nation of notion of genius is one who is able to think in a way without precedent. That's right. what it means. Um, how can that possibly work when all of the gatekeepers of all the creative industries are saying, no, you've got to produce propaganda, not yeah. not art. You know, I have a friend who, a, a, a crime novelist, he's now had to leave his publisher and start self-publishing because the uh, the sensitivity readers kept coming in and saying, no, your, your, your characters can't say this. The, his villains can't have these negative attitudes towards minority groups. He's serial killers. So they're fine with the serial killers chopping bits off people and, and torturing them and hanging them on a meat hook. But if they say something problematic about gays, <laughs> uh, no, that's got that's got to change. Yeah. You know? So so and you can't you can't be an artist if you are constantly being curtailed in this way. It's it's fascinating to me too. Uh, you know, Hayek uh, in the counter revolution of science uh, of all books. And Friedrich Hayek is not the guy that I think of as like, oh, he, I really want to get his restaurant and film recommendations. But he talks about how literature and art is this storehouse of human experience and that, yes. you know, it's a way of communicating with the past and coming to terms with it. And I always think when people talk, you were, you were talking about wokeness uh, or social justice as, a, as 
it's about experience that unless you belong to a particular group, you cannot understand it and you never will. And so you just have yeah. to accept their testimony. There's this amazing passage in Frederick Douglass's autobiography where he had been taught to read illegally by uh, the mistress of one of his owners or overseers. And then uh, he somehow came across um, uh, 19th century pamphlets written by Irishmen who wanted to be freed from England. And, and they were talking about individualism and liberty and freedom. And he says something like, when I read those pamphlets, I realized what I wanted. And right. it's this incredible transatlantic empathy where he artic he figures out what he wants by reading, uh, you know, Irish people, you know, across the ocean in a different context is kind of amazing. And and then you know it's it, just to make it even more bizarre when he escapes to freedom and, and goes to Ma uh, Massachusetts and works as a ship caulker, he gets beaten up by Irish people who see him as a threat because he's going to undercut their labor. But it's like. You know, without reading, you know, without being able to, I mean, how do you know what other people are thinking and how do you know yourself as an individual? You know, I, I, I mean, how do you become an individual if you don't start to connect with different people having experiences that are either very similar to yours or incredibly different? Which is also why this idea that authors and writers should stay in their lane and only write yeah. about their own experiences is so, is so damaging and wrong. And you're absolutely right. The, the, the reason why literature is so important is it, it connects us to the past. It connects us to the great minds of history. It enables us to think about our own lives in different ways. It, 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 it is the foundation, I think, of empathy in a lot yeah. of cases. Um, I think. And there's uh, tons of revisions to the canon to be done. I mean, this is where I think a lot of conservatives, you know, are wrong, where they say, well, there are 10, maybe 15 great writers and we should just read them all the time. And they get antsy oh, yes, if wrong. you introduce. You uh, talk about a, uh, a particular, I wanted to bring her up because if we can get her, uh, you uh, talk about a writer named Stella Benson, who you're very fond of. Could you explain yeah. who she is and why she is not getting the, um, the kind of readership she deserves? So Stella Benson uh, was a suffragette, uh, was a, um, uh, um, a writer who... Um, her novels now what 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 are her dates now she's late 1800s to i think around 1930 i think she died around then i think that's about right um so she wrote some incredible works uh so her novels are br brilliant i mean she she has such a poeticism to her language um she, she's so eccentric and you know often when i read novels i i, I often underline particular turns of phrase that I think are striking. Hmm. I had to stop with her because I'm doing it four or five <laughs> times every page. Um, and, and yet no one's heard of her. I mean, no one has heard of her. No one reads her. Um, and you, and I think it might be, and there's no chance. Of, what I say in the book is there's no chance of her coming back because if you read her first novel, it's called I pose, which is a massively eccentric piece of work it's two chapters chapter one is something like 300 pages chapter two is 10 pages <laughs> everything is off kilter in this book it's bizarre and funny and satirical and just everything but it's it's it has some depictions of race that even made me think mm. oh blimey that's a bit much you know yeah. it's 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 by our standards these are racist depictions right. they weren't by her standards and in, in, in the society that she uh, occupied because of that, this will be dismissed as just a racist piece of work. And that means we, we've missed an incredible artist mm. and, and, and she cannot be rehabilitated in this climate and we cannot read her. Uh, and I think that's a real tragedy. I mean, and I understand why reading depictions of race that we find offensive today, that I find offensive today, um, can be off-putting. But this is why I also think education helps because you are able to contextualize and understand that ethical trends change over time. And uh, the, the, the meaning of those words in her context are not the same as in ours. Um, but I think one of, uh, one of her other great books is called The Poor Man, which is a really fantastic piece of work. She captures something about the pathetic young male <laughs> who mm. has no prospects and is always second place um, in just a really great, fascinating way. So I would, I would urge people to read perhaps that yeah. book. Perhaps The Poor Man is a good way, way in. So to, to you also, that. so encountering art, you know, apart from kind of ideological 
filters or, you know, where, you know, going back to a kind of Soviet model of art where the only thing, you know, there should only be propaganda for the one yeah. true way of living. Um, you know, that's one way around this. You also uh, stress critical thinking and you, you've, you, you obviously, you have a PhD, you are a multiple, you know, a performer in, in different, you know, kind of outlets and things like that. You taught how important is critical thinking and how, how do we get there? Um, particularly given the educational system that seems to have kind of settled like a, a plague on most of the developed world. Yeah. So um, because uh, what critical social justice do is it does is it offers you a, a guide, a, a set of rules, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, it invites you not to think. It invites you to outsource your thinking to, to someone else. Uh, it, this is why it is so damaging on an individual basis, and it is anti-educational. So I think... Uh, it would die if we had critical thinking built into our education system. No ideology could be sustained in that way, just in the way that people used to be educated out of extreme religious belief. Right. Uh, you would be, you know, if you are educated properly, I don't believe you could succumb to critical uh, social justice as a, as a belief system. I don't think it would be possible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think, um, how would you embed it? Well, lots of people have tried to create these courses called critical thinking and quite literally have them as a class. In, I used to teach critical thinking A-level, right, to 16, 17-year-olds. But it doesn't really work. I mean, it, you know, in a sense that there are helpful elements of it and people understand why when they're indulging in ad hominem, they've already lost the argument, when they're intuiting motive, all the various, all the fallacies that it's useful to be aware of. But actually, I think a better way is to embed it in every lesson all the time as just a, 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 a general way of being rather than another set of rules. Mm -hmm. You know, giving people a set of rules of how to argue doesn't necessarily teach them right. how to think, you know. Uh, it, it is about your pedagogical practice. It is about challenging all the time, challenging ideas, even if you hold them yourself. Mm -hmm. um, testing uh, the, the, where, where the thought process of pupils goes to. Um, you know, not simply saying this is the way things are. No. You know, you was, see these there, awful... was there a time when people did that or in your education? Um, you know, I'd, uh, you know, I mean, I know in my education in the United States, I went to uh, mediocre Catholic schools and there wasn't a lot of emphasis on. No, no. You know, and, and perhaps that's always been lacking. But one of the ways through it is literature, yeah. actually, mm -hmm. be be because if you're exposed to a wide range of ideas about the world, you inevitably will start to realize that one way of thought thinking isn't right, that yeah. there are multiple ways of seeing the world. And that's why it's really important that, that the canon is diverse, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think it, it, the humanities in particular lend themselves to critical thought because you are exposed to such a wide range of, of, of worldviews. Mm -hmm. And that is how, you know, that is how genius is produced as well. Yeah. It's a shame then that the humanity, I mean, I, in the United States, I know that, you know, this is one indicator among many, but the number of English majors is plummeted everywhere. Right. Uh, and yeah. other other language literary uh, majors, you know, their departments are just disappearing um, because people are not interested or it's not seen as relevant or it's too churchy. You know, it's um, why would oh, you yeah, want to I mean, go and get harangued well, I, for four years as an undergrad? But even even when I was at university, when I was an undergraduate, studying english you know yeah. the way to get a top mark was to problematize the text right explain why you think the merchant of venice is homophobic explain you know explain the evils of the uh, of the author right yeah. so tease out this is what this started back with the um the feminist critiques like kate millett's uh, sexual right. politics where all of a sudden norman mailer uh, dh lawrence th th these are just misogynists now right and and, and you know maybe they were but <laughs> but you know, that doesn't, I think, uh, I believe it was up. Norman Mailer's second wife that he stabbed would probably yeah, be right. like, yeah, so probably there's, there's, misogynist, but yeah. there's a case for that. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But you know, I don't care about an artist's moral shortcomings right. because I'm of the view that art has nothing to do with morality. Yeah. And I know that art can be moral, can be, there are great works of art that, that preach a particular, particular message. Let's say Guernica, for instance. Yeah. Uh, if you want, if you could say the works of Dickens, George Orwell wrote an essay about about that um he doesn't think that dickens went far enough with his uh with his uh, uh moral tutelage but nevertheless 
I think the best art is that which is which is completely divorced from the idea of, of morality. Um, I quote in the book um, the preface to Dorian Gray, the picture mm-hmm. of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde, because he he was responding to his critics. Yeah. You know, the critics were so outraged by this book that he added a preface, which ex- which I think all critics should read. It's about how good and evil are just materials for an artist to play with, right. and about how he uses the phrase "there is no such thing as a moral or an immoral book." books are well written or badly written that right. is all yeah. i very much subscribe to that view and so when you talk to me about how uh you know the, the eric gill was a monster and therefore we should destroy his statues i'm not going to go along with that mm-hmm. because i don't care i i care that uh, this is not to be flippant about that his crimes yeah. if he were alive today yeah, I'd explain want to see who he dog. is for an american audience well he's he's a a, a british artist who was uh who if you come to London, if you go to the BBC Broadcasting House, you'll see a statue of his of Ariel and Prospero from Shakespeare's The Tempest above uh, the the main entrance, and it, um, it's a beautiful piece of work. And he is a tremendous artist, um, modern artist. You know, but, and there are and many- also a self described rapist, right, or sexual Rape criminal. his daughters and the family dog. Yeah. I mean, a monster, really. Yeah. And uh, you know, I would want him on trial and in prison were he alive today right. but but i do not want his art destroyed because his art never molested anyone right and i think you absolutely have to be able to separate the art from the artist i think it's absolutely key because if you don't do that the western canon is gonna is gone <laughs> basically yeah well it, it in england or, or in the uk is it similar that it's right wingers who want to ban books in, in the u.s um you know to the extent and nobody's actually banning books but you know kind of when things come under challenge, particularly in high schools, it's usually uh, conservatives that are used leading to be, the didn't charge. It? Definitely used to be. Uh, that's changing now. Now it seems to yeah. be coming from uh, woke activists who call themselves left wing. Right. I mean, the, the example I give in the book is the uh, Ontario District School Board. Was it Ontario? Mm. Toronto, maybe? Sorry, it's somewhere in Canada where a, 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 a school body which was in charge of 30 elementary schools took 5,000 books off library shelves because they contained outdated stereotypes, racial Mm. stereotypes, and they burnt some of them. And not only did they burn them, they called it a flame purification ceremony. (laughs) It's like they're reading Ray Bradbury. It's like, this is insane. And they even used the ashes to plant a tree to show what a progressive, beautiful idea it was. So, you know, that's, I mean, that's the destruction of art and literature is always authoritarian. Yeah, it, 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 you know, th- there's no getting around that. But that that to me, so many of the problems we're seeing from, from in terms of censorship, in terms of publishing houses mm-hmm. who are attempting to curtail what their artists can and cannot say, right. those people all think they're on the left. Right. Yeah. So and yet yeah, you're going to get the I mean, right wing reservations about about art and literature has always been largely prudish, actually. Right. From a, a sort of uh, a sort of sense of um, moral indignation. Yeah. Uh, but also a belief that that if people are exposed to corrupting influences in art, they become corrupted Absolutely. and they become evil. Bad people then, read bad books. There's no question. And that's the same yeah. that the woke believe. The woke are very close to the right yeah. when it comes to these ideas. Really close. So indistinguishable, actually. You know, um, to to bring it back to the Puritans, um, you know, one of the uh, witch trial judges, Samuel Sewell. Uh, famously, he was the first one to recant and say, you know what, we really fucked up. Like this, yeah. this was wrong. Um, he went so far, he he published a long apology for it. He wore sackcloth and ashes and kind of wandered around uh, Salem for most of the rest of his life. He ended up writing the first anti-slavery tract in the colonies, the selling of Joseph. Um, who will be, or does, does the end of critical social justice or the wokeness fever that we're in, does it need Samuel Sewell's, like people from within who are like, holy moly, this was, you know, I'm sorry, I mean, this was just wrong. Um, yes. And yes, who would, who do you think those people will be? Uh, it's going to be really difficult because whenever um, the woke are shown to be uh, implementing ideas that lead to great moral evils, uh, they double down. Uh so it's going to be really hard, um, particularly because the stakes are very high. Um, one of the examples that I think is most important is the the transing of children, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and, and in America, it's a lot worse. You have young, healthy teenage girls having double mastectomies 
you have uh, young boys, effeminate boys having their genitals removed um, and put on lifelong medication. Uh, there's a young gay man called Richie Heron who's currently suing the NHS here in the UK because his genitals were, were removed mm-hmm. and now he doesn't have a sex life because he was encouraged, because he was a, a young gay man struggling with his homosexuality, he was encouraged to believe he was actually a woman. Um, the, the vast majority of uh, children who experience sense, uh, a sense of gender dysphoria are, end up being gay. You know, and those and the vast majority end up being uh, that ends up being resolved through the natural process of puberty. Right. So what we are, what we have done and, in the and name can of can I just uh, to dilate on that for a second? You you write in the book that body dysmorphia or gender dysmorphia is real. Uh, it exists, but overwhelmingly, particularly in prepubescent kids or or in in children under the age of legal majority, it resolves yeah. itself um, either where the kids turn out not to be gay or they are gay or they can transition when they're older. So yeah, this... you can't make any, you can't make any assumptions about a child's sexuality or anything like that. But what you can say is that we have got the data on this. Uh, there is a strong correlation between gender nonconformity in youth and homosexuality in later life. Mm-hmm. So it's not an exact science, but very, very strong correlation. Autism as well is often associated with uh, disproportionately mm-hmm. with, with feelings of gender dysphoria in youth. So what you but so what but the Tavistock Clinic in London and various clinics in America take the gender affirmative approach. So a child comes to them and says, a, a boy comes to them and says, I think I'm a girl. They say, then you are a girl, and let's put you on puberty blockers, which always leads to cross sex hormones, which often leads to infertility and irreversible damage. So the the the, the problem here is we're doing what they do in Iran. You're fixing gay people. You're heterosexualizing them. Uh, you're saying if you don't conform to traditional gender stereotypes, you must be altered so that you do. It's the most reactionary, mm-hmm. heteronormative, if you like, uh, form of gay conversion therapy. That's what it is. Wow. So, uh, and it's extreme. It's it's medicalizing and sterilizing gay kids. Sounds like something out of Nazi history, and and it's been done in the name in the name of wokeness. Now, yeah. at some point, people are going to have to admit that they mutilated their own children. That's a big ask, isn't it? Yeah. And, and I don't think people are going to want to admit that, even to themselves. And so they, they will have to double down. But ultimately, uh, we're getting a lot of detransitioners now, people who are now adults, who were set on this path as children. There's up to a thousand different families are potentially suing the Tavistock Clinic in London at the moment. So this is a medical scandal that is going to break big. And particularly in America, where you're also litigious over there. Yeah. It, you know, it's, it's going to be extreme. And... And I think people are going to have to concede that they did this terrible thing yeah. from the best of intentions, right? That's what makes it slightly different, doesn't it? What, um, just as a side note on that, it seems that the uh, the term TERF, trans exclusionary radical feminists, uh, is, is, that seems to be more of a thing in England or in Britain than it is in the United States, that you have right. kind of second, maybe third wave feminists who are very emphatic that trans women are not the same as women, as as women who are born uh, female. Um, what do you think explains that? Why is uh, why why does there seem to be a stronger commitment to a, a slightly different type of feminism in in the UK? I think it's just here? that in, in intersectional intersectional feminism has originated in america i think it's just it's more advanced and deeply set Mm -hmm. i think um the religious the religion of gender identity is is now your state religion i think Mm -hmm. it's just there so i think you know they call us turf island don't they um what it means is we have a lot of people over here who understand that the biological differences between men and women and we still we can we can still do that um but you know you've got uh, someone who was recently appointed to the supreme court who claimed that she couldn't define woman because she's not a biologist. So, you know, the rot is pretty deep in America. Um, so I think, and you know, that, that turf slur, it's just, a, it's the equivalent of which that's all it is. Um, and it's, it's leveled at people who aren't transphobic, who aren't hateful, who want people to be able to live their lives however they want to, but also want us to acknowledge that women's rights and gay rights are predicated on the recognition of biological reality, hmm. you know? And, and if you don't, Except if you believe that uh, that men and women are are men and women because they identify as men and women, if you see it, these as identity categories, as a kind of sexed soul, as Helen Joyce puts it, um, well, then there's no such thing as gay rights anymore. It's gone. 
um, it's obliterated. So there's, you know, there, you know, if there are serious things at stake here, I just think it's all, it almost feels like America's lost on that. Hmm. Canada certainly is. Hmm. Um, but there is still, I mean, we, there are things happening in the UK now. We now have a prime minister who is saying openly that the Equality Act here is there to defend, to protect people on the basis of biological sex. And that does not mean gender identity. And he's made that very clear, hmm. which means that you you won't have biological males in women's prisons. Uh, you won't have biological males in domestic violence refuge centres or rape crisis centres. You won't have biological males in women's sport, hmm. in women's changing rooms. And that's important. It's an important safeguarding issue. So, uh, but in America, it seems like a man can um, win the gold medal in a swimming race, in a women's swimming race, and everyone has to play along and pretend he's a woman. Hmm. And that's not that's not good. Um, you uh, close the book with a uh, a kind of uh, uh, anecdote about the Ipswich Bridge, and I think that might be a, a good way to end this interview um, because it goes to this question of how do we how do we pull back from the the most ridiculous aspects of critical social justice, of wokeness, of political correctness? Um, what is Ipswich Bridge, and why does it show up at the end of your book? Because it's it was a moment in the history of the Salem witch trials that I think is quite key. Uh, the, the 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 hysteria spread. It started in Salem Village. It went over to Salem Town, Andover, Topsfield, and you know, we there there were residents calling for the girls of Salem to come and diagnose their their people who they thought might be you know possessed by devils and there was just one moment where the girls were on Ipswich Bridge uh and i think it was in Andover Ipswich Bridge or near to Andover and they passed an, uh, a woman on the bridge and they did their thing they started falling into convulsions and fits and pointing and screaming witch and all the rest of it and everyone just ignored them all the adults there rather than say oh you know what what's happening here we should arrest this woman etc they just walked on they ignored them and the girls stopped screaming and just got on with their business and and it is said that after that event they never cried witch on anyone again hmm. and i think that's why i say this is our ipswich bridge moment we can continue to pander to the insane hysterical fantasies of of these activists who say that there is no such thing as men and women that fascists are in every shadow uh, that that systemic racism is uh, that racism underpins every human interaction, etc. Or we can ignore them and say, no, your fantasies are your fantasies, and they're your problem to deal with. Society doesn't get reconstructed around your collective fantasy, not anymore. And that's what's happened in Salem, and that's what I'd like to see happen now. And that's why I mean, I think this is the Ipswich Bridge moment. And if we don't seize this opportunity, well, the the, the future looks pretty bleak. It looks. Because the woke movement is an authoritarian movement, we're paving the way for authoritarianism. It's never good. All right. We're going to leave it there. The book is The New Puritans, How the Religion of Social Justice Captured the Western World. Andrew Doyle, thanks for talking to Reason. Thank you very much. <laughs>